This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by The Ben Heck Show. So you've got your SIP server and you get service from them and they connect the call. But what does that call? What is it? Then they give you the number for free, but obviously, it, they, well, so some... on, on your side, you, um, in, in my case, I have it connected to a, a, a SIP gateway device that connects an old Bakelite rotary phone to So an <laughs> to ATA, my so, a, you know. a little, little box that takes in an old uh, RJ11 based yeah. handset yeah. 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 and then converts that to the yeah. Ethernet exactly. and then it connects FXS, to your. FXS, FXO ports. And all that nonsense. Um, yeah, and it's got you know like this old timey phone, which is you know with a uh, mechanical ringer, which right. is amazing. So you say that this company out of Seattle, though, they give you a number for free. Mm -hmm. How do they? How do, and, and is there any other service that you pay or a fee that you pay them? Uh, yeah, not, uh, so they they use some trick of the telephony system. When a call originates, when you dial a call, it originates mm -hmm. from one point and uh, terminates in another. Uh, the phone company who owns the termination point can charge the originating company. Uh, for just for allowing you to end a call there, um, and as long as it's symmetric, uh, you can charge whatever you like. As you know, in the this US. is the way that the whole peer system yeah, works. Exactly. Because back when AT and T was broken off into all the baby bells or the right. regional bell operating centers in the '60s, you know everybody had to kind of. It's just like we have peering relationships with. You know, um, Packet Eight has exactly. peering relationships with Cogent. You know, and everybody else that runs the backbones. Exactly. Um, so, and I, I totally get that, that, you know, like if I'm the phone company and I'm the originator, mm -hmm. I'm already charging my subscribers. Right. So I don't mind paying you whatever right. your fee is. Right. But these right. fees are, are stupid, right? They're, they're like a penny per okay. call. So it's not that bad. But so so the these guys out of Seattle actually make a penny every they time somebody calls your, to yeah, every time your so doorbell. A call comes in since it just goes straight to their network and assuming their bandwidth costs are less than their, uh, the cost that they pay to maintain their, their telephone company status. Yeah, you know, they make they make money on every call that comes in, and since you can't dial out from them, it doesn't matter how symmetric. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. They're they, always uh, going to make a dime. They make they make a dime every time someone calls, and so they, they've got a good business going. Oh, um, that's cool. Interesting, well, actually. There's this uh, company in Iowa that went under. Um, the government will subsidize uh, telephone companies to provide service in rural areas. Just you know. Because otherwise, why would you go provide service there? And yeah, the, the government gave a lot of money to a lot of big phone companies that did nothing with. Anyway, I'm digressing. Um, well, this this company they did something really interesting. The subsidy was so much that they could uh, terminate calls. So they they, they charge the usual termination fees, and they terminate calls in their little phone company in Iowa. And so they get that, but then they get the government subsidy, and somehow through some trick of of, of financing, they they were able to. Uh, it was more than the cost. To make outbound international dials, so you would call this number in Iowa. They would collect money on that call, mm -hmm. and as long as you know calls were under a certain length, you could call anywhere for free. They would just give it out for free, and they would make money from the government. Can you can you believe back in the '90s we used to clip these alligator clips to unscrupulous things and and, and do those, and it would cost a fortune? Yeah, it's it's ridiculous yeah, now. It's no, super cheap. I love yeah, that. It's, yeah. So um, it's a shame they went under. Yeah, they, and you didn't I even have to use a 2600 hertz no, tone no. or anything to connect your call. Just a regular phone, <laughs> yeah, nice. no red boxing. Um, so yeah, so uh, so it's it's super cheap, and and so that's inbound dial. Um, if so what do you do for outbound? For outbound, um, you can. So there's a, a companies provide SIP service, a SIP trunking is what they call it, um, and you just find whatever VoIP provider which happens to have good rates. Um, local phone dot com.org gives you something like half a cent per minute on all outbound calls, so throw wow. in ten dollars and I mean you're That's never ridiculous gonna, you're never cheap. gonna use all those. Yeah. I mean don't get me wrong, you know, four and a half dollars to Skype is cheap, right. but you know, but, when you wanna talk about setting up a doorbell here. Yeah, yeah that's really cool. Yeah. Um, now, how does that work with your DID or your direct inbound dial that you get from one service provider now when you make outbound calls with another how well, so so Free Switch has uh, what they call SIP profiles, and you basically set up a profile uh, for each of your providers, um, and then you set up your dial plan so that when calls come in from one provider, uh, it executes certain code and you know routes it to all, ring all your phones or or send off to you know wherever you like, um, and then when you make an outbound dial from inter inside the network, it routes it off to your other profile and then sends that out through you know. So you just set up, so you set them up. Um, you put some rules in and say like, hey, only this number can do outbound dial. Just you know, make sure you lock down because. <laughs> okay, so so it uses a different number yeah. or does well, it pass it, over so your it, CID, it, your caller ID? It doesn't. So it depends on your VoIP provider. But mm. uh, the most common thing that I've seen was that they just since it doesn't really originate from a real phone number. Yeah. And it's just a dial that you know comes out of the ether. Um, most of the time, when you receive a call from cell phones uh, or, or on cell phones from from 
you know, of what provider. It just comes in as unknown. Mm. Um, so it's not a real number. Uh, <laughs> just block, collar block kind of thing. Um, and so, so, I mean, I don't know. I, like I said, I just used it to call the pizza guy. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so, there you go. So that, that uh, it's not really a big deal for me. Yeah, I know that uh, a lot of the fun stuff that you can do with asterisk, uh, actually, you know, with the caller ID, you mm. can to totally do caller ID spoofing. Yeah, well, yeah, you, you can do all the same things. Tell me about that. You can, well, you know, like when you set up a call out of free switch, you can manipulate your, your, your SIP headers. We might have to. We may have to go down to uh, Ace Monster Toys and start having fun with that. <laughs> Listen, I, I want to hear about the. Uh, so you've taken this, like obviously, you know, uh, hacker kind of geeky VoIP stuff, and you've mm -hmm. turned it into this new company of yours. Tell me about that. So Custard is. Um, we wanted to uh, improve customer and. Uh, uh, sorry, we wanted, like if you're a retail shop, we want to improve your relationship with the customer and. Uh, one of the things that we do is we uh, have this click to call feature that we um, we sell on the Shopify app store, and uh, basically what we found is that increasing customer engagement, be it through chatting or just like having a number right on the screen, um, tends to lead to more sales. And okay. so uh, what we're doing is we're using VoIP, we're leveraging VoIP and you know browser flash technologies to to be able to you know so if so someone comes onto your site. They want to talk to you. They can just click a button and connect directly to you know your customer ser service or your sales reps or whatever, um, and and this just increases customer satisfaction and and uh, like overall like if you're just if you're running a company it's 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 a good thing more sales more money yeah yeah there you go I mean you get that badge that says hey call yeah, here and then boom quick to call yeah. okay. Yeah. Neat, and that just kind of grew out of you were saying a uh, like a hackathon and yeah, new projects. So, That's neat. Um, yeah, so we uh, we participated in a, a hackathon a month and a half ago, and uh, so you guys are new, new. We are we are just you know new kids on the block. We just we've only been around for two months, um, and uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, <laughs> I love to see that though the, the the hacker mentality of like oh I can do this for my front doorbell and and then go ahead and monetize it and turn it into a company where you connect customers with shops and, right. and things of that nature so where can people go to find out more about uh, the custard stuff uh, custard you just hit up uh, getcustard.com and uh, right now we're only live on the Shopify app store but uh, so there's a little Shopify button click that and go check it out if you run Shopify if you're on Shopify store. Um, we're going to be doing general availability pretty soon, maybe towards the end of the month. And uh, you know, if you run any site and you just want people to call you, uh, that that'll be there soon. And you know, uh, yeah. Nice, Christian. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing Thank with us some of your uh, VoIP knowledge. I think there might be some some fun DTMF loving uh, features in our future. All right. Jolly OS. Put simply, it's an OS that looks like a cross between Android and GNOME, and it lets you quickly browse the web and find your networks and your favorite links. It's really eerily similar to Chrome OS, and it even uses Chrome as the default browser. Now this operating system lets you simply click on an app and instantly be taken to that main site, and you can also follow friends and favorite apps that you use daily. Now to get Jolly OS, you just go over to jollycloud.com and you download the Dual Boot EXE from their site so you can keep Windows on your desktop or on your uh, laptop. And it downloads and is installed in just a couple of minutes. You'll create your own Jolly Cl Cloud username and your password and then you're pretty much set. At least, kind of. I ran into an issue when I was setting it up. I have a Broadcom wireless card in my computer, different from Darren who got the perfect wireless card in his, which I oh, kind of regret now, and Jolly OS couldn't see it. And since there's no way for me to get into the terminal from the OS, I basically don't have a way to fix that. So you're screwed if you don't have a wired ethernet that you can connect to. Thank God I have one in here. So at least I didn't did have a workaround, but how do you get into the terminal through Jolly OS? I'm still working on that one. All right. Jolly OS, it's pretty simple, and you can even access the same stuff just through Windows via your my.jollycloud.com site. You can customize your icons and your wallpapers. So, for example, I can go down here and change around my wallpapers, find something really pretty, and I can also uh, move around my icons. And I can choose to download new ones by clicking there and choosing Add. So I'll add the VLC icon. 
A lot of these icons are basically just bookmarks to different kinds of websites and different kind of programs. And you can follow people and connect to your Facebook as well and browse your Windows OS, Jolly, and Dropbox, and even your Google Documents and mess with your settings. So it's a simplified browsing experience. So let's check it out a little bit. So clicking the A will bring you back to the regular desktop where you can see all of your different apps that you have downloaded and added. If you click on the little signal up here, it'll take you to your stream, which shows you everything that you are following, all your friends. So I'm following Veronica and Jolly Cloud right here. You can see the stream of everything that they've added. So I can see Jolly Cloud has a, added a bunch of favorite apps to theirs. And I can go through here and say, oh, Google Mo Music, that sounds like a good app. So I'll click Add, and it adds it to my own desktop. I can also choose top members, public pages, and so on and so on. From my stream, I can see that I've added a whole bunch of different favorite apps as well, Gmail, Twitter, and Facebook, of course. Underneath the folder icon, it shows you this device, which is Jolly OS, and then I can also browse my Windows operating system, all the files in there, system reserved, and then my Dropbox, if I decided to set that up, and Google Documents. Under the settings, I have this strange thing called badges. Uh, this new badge showed up for me today. It says you have recycled at least one computer by installing Jolly OS. Even though I still have Windows and Ubuntu as well dual booting on this machine, so I'm not really sure what it's talking about. Huh, I don't know. I can also view my history, everything that's going on on my computer. And under this device, I can change any kind of settings. And from my main screen, I can now see when I added Google Music, it appears right here. And when I pull it up, a new Chrome browser shows up and just has me log into Google Music with whatever my name is, Snubsy for my account, and get in there and just start playing with the music or whatever, what have you. Personally, I think Jolly OS is a little bit too easy for my taste. I need more customization and I need more abilities in my operating system, not just web browsing. Web browsing is nice, but Jolly OS, come on, I, I mean, where's my terminal? I still got that problem. So what do you guys think? Email me at feedback at hack5.org, especially if you found the terminal in Jolly OS with all of your comments. And coming up soon, we'll be answering your viewer questions. But first, let's take a quick break and then check in with Darren for the nibble. Join modding wizard Ben Hack and Friends as they build and modify a host of amazing community-inspired creations. And be sure to check out new episodes of the Ben Hack Show every two weeks right here at revision3.com slash tbhs. In the latest episode of the Ben Hack Show, someone needs a specialized controller from Ben, but he only decides to make it after having a change of heart. And in the holiday spirit, Ben encourages you to get out there and build or make something of your own. Need some inspiration? Stay tuned to element14.com slash tbhs to find out how you can enter to win one of 50 subscriptions to Make Magazine as well as the latest builds from the show. It's time once again for the nibble and this week Shell writes in to say that there is a great command called watch which executes a command Periodically, he says, for example, if you've, uh, say, rebooted a Windows server and you want to watch to monitor port 3389, as we know to be RDP, to see whether or not you can log back in, well, you can go ahead and issue the following command. Watch, then in quotes, we go ahead and do nmap, tack p for the port, we're looking for 3389, and then our host, 1073 for me at least, and the quotes, and there you go. And as you can see, every two seconds up here, it's going to run this and give us the results. Of course, there are a whole bunch of command line options you can use. I believe it's tack n for how frequently you want it to happen. And I want to thank you so much, Shell, for sending that by. And if you guys have four bits you want to send our way, hack5.org slash nibble. We'd love to hear from you.